introduce My name is Kristen Kara. I'm the project manager uh, from the BRA who's overseeing the Government Center Garage Redevelopment Project. Um, I'm actually going to go through a bunch of housekeeping items before we actually get into the meeting tonight, so I would ask that you please uh, bear with me. So first things first, um, I just would like everybody to be aware that tonight's meeting is being videotaped um, by Matt Conti from uh, North End Dot. NorthendWaterfront.com. So tonight's meeting will be posted on uh, Matt's website. So just again, so everybody is aware. And just to make note that um, an IAG or an Impact Advisory Group meeting, which tonight's meeting is, is technically not um, subject to open uh, meeting laws. But in the spirit of openness and transparency, we were happy to accommodate uh, Matt's request. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize a bunch of. Um, elected officials that are here tonight that took the time to attend tonight's meeting. Uh, Representative Walsh and her staff person David Blaisdell is here too. Um, Representative Michaelwitz is here. Um, Representative Walsh is also here. Um, Will Anua from the Mayor's Office and Neighborhood Services is here as well as Michelle Snyder from Councilor Ross's office. And I'm also joined tonight by some colleagues at the BRA um, Peter Borey, Warren, Shirtliff, and John, really all from the area's planning department, and I'm sure many people here tonight are familiar with uh, my colleagues. Um, um, okay, so also at this time, I'd like to ask any members of the press, in addition to Matt, um, who are here tonight, if you could just recognize yourself. Uh, I'm Jeremy Barnes from Boston.com. Okay. There's some other. Patrick yeah. Rose Boston Mobile. Thank you. And there's somebody in the back, too. Rob Johnson, Boston Herald. Great, thank you. And I would ask you if um, you have not signed in yet, there's a sign in sheet um, out front, and I'd really appreciate it if you could sign in. I'll add you to our um, mailing list for uh, meetings. So, in terms of um, other housekeeping matters, I would ask you just to remember that tonight's meeting is an impact advisory group working session. So it's really meant for the members of the IAG. Of course, we'll open it up at the end. We'll try to keep the time, but I know people are going to sit through the meeting, and I'm sure we'll have questions or comments. So I would ask that you please uh, bear with us and just wait until the IAG has had an opportunity to speak or ask questions. And also, if you could also um, uh, obviously identify yourself, but also say where you're from, because that's helpful to know who's um, interested um, in the project. So in terms of the actual impact advisory group, this group was um, nominated, just to give some history on what an impact advisory group is, this group was nominated by the various district elected officials, as well as at large city councilors, as well as the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, and the BRA is also invited to nominate people to sit on the IAG, and ultimately the IAG is appointed by the Mayor. And the purpose of the IAG is to help the city and the BRA to identify potential impacts of a proposed project and then help us come up with potential mitigation measures um, with the project. So in this particular IAG, there was 12 people appointed, and um, I, I recognize some familiar faces in the room. Originally, this project had started up in uh, 2009, so the, the first official filing which triggered the city's review process, um, that filing was called a project notification form, so that was submitted back in 2009, I believe it was March, and then in response, the BRA issued what's called the scoping determination, and it outlined in uh, extreme detail all the different studies and analyses that the development team needed to um, perform, and then filed an additional filing called a draft project impact report. So where we left off in 2009, the BRA had issued the scoping uh, determination, and we continued, the IAG continued to meet. And then um, late in 2009, early 2010, the project was put on hold mainly due to economic reasons. So we're now starting up the process again. Um, Tom O'Brien, who I'll officially um, introduce in a few minutes, his team, um, HYM Investment Group, is overseeing the permitting and will be the developer of the project. The same investment team is involved, and Tom will introduce his team and give you some more background on who um, the investors are. So in terms of where we are in process, what has happened is um, on behalf of the investment group, Tom O'Brien's company has submitted a new letter of intent, which was submitted to the BRA in June of this year. And essentially what the letter of intent said was, 
um, we're going to submit a new project notification form. So all the old filings, the BRA scoping determination, this new filing that has not been submitted yet, the project notification form, um, will replace all of the original filings. So essentially we're starting a new process. So technically tonight's meeting, there's no official filing. Again, the letter of intent was submitted, sort of notifying, giving us um, notice that in the coming months that a project notification form would be submitted which triggers a 30-day comment period. We'll have a community meeting. I'm assuming it will probably be here. So that's what triggers um, the official review process. So tonight we're not in a comment period. It's just really meant to give the IAG an opportunity to interact with the developer, the consultants that are on the team, to ask questions because we haven't met in quite some time. So in terms of sort of tonight's agenda, it's really to see what the team has been working on, what the next steps are, and to notify all of you that the next step is the, the project notification form which probably will be submitted sometime in September certainly um, in the coming months so a few other things to say about the IEG um, so originally 12 members and since actually um, scheduling tonight's meeting three members due to mostly travel schedules have asked to step down from the IEG just because they felt they couldn't they didn't want to stay on if they couldn't make um, the commitment so those members and we'll eventually go around and I'll just ask everybody to briefly say a few words, introduce themselves. Um, Deborah Connors, who is from Beacon Hill, who had originally been nominated by Representative DeMacy, is no longer gonna be on the IAG. Also, Michael Ratty, who had been um, nominated by the BRA, um, he moved to the South End, so it makes sense to have, to continue to have North End representative on the IAG. And then also uh, Mark Paul, who is from the North End, from the North End Waterfront Residents Association. He no longer can serve, so he was appointed, excuse me, nominated by the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, so the most appropriate and diplomatic way to figure out who gets to nominate new people to replace these three members would be the people who originally had nominated those individuals. So Representative Michael Witz would be nominating somebody um, in place of Deborah um, Connors. So just to give you some background on that. So moving forward, you'll see three new faces on um, IEG and also a few members tonight um, couldn't attend. So I think once we go around, I'll also acknowledge the members that originally couldn't be here tonight. So Marta, could we start with you? Marta McGuire from the West End. Kim Pecos, H.N. Gorney. Representative Marty Walls. Jane Forrestal, the West End. Tad Stoll, the Hill. Dave Roderick, North End. Francine Gannon, also from North End. Bob O'Brien, Downtown North Association. So Linda Joan Ash, who sits on the IAG as the um, Greenway Conservancy representative, could come tonight. Um, nor could um, Marie Simboli, who's from the North End. So moving forward, you'll also see those two individuals um, on the IAG. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom O'Brien, and then um, we'll open it up to the IEG for questions, comments, and then we'll open it up at the end for uh, general questions and comments. So thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, good evening again, everybody. My name is Tom O'Brien, and the name of my company is the HYM Investment Group. Uh, we brought with us a pretty full group of people who are, are part of the team, so I want to make sure that you see all the folks who are here. So I'm going to ask each of them we could one more round of introductions to stand up and and uh, and just say where they're from. So, Greg, do you want to? St we're going to start down that end if that's okay. Greg Lucer from CBT. Peter's already been introduced. So, if you Richard Burton, CBT. <clears throat> David Hancock from CBT. <clears throat> Kevin Birdie from uh, National Electrical Benefit Fund. And I'm going to describe for everybody, you know, after this, who, who all the team. Peter, sorry. I'm Ian Hill from Mechanic Pacific Properties. Doug Manns from the HYM Investment Group. David Bracken, HYM. I'm Jim Green from the Redmond Private Council. Howard Mosher with BHP. Guy Busa, Harris San Hudson. Kishore Varanasi, CBT. Don Hero, CBT. And also helping us with uh, press and public affairs, Tom Palmer's in the, in the back as well. Um, so let me just be sure that you understand the team. So the architects uh, for us will be CBT, okay? Um, the on-the-ground development company is the HYM Investment Group. Sorry, I'm back to you guys. I apologize. The, um, 
still getting used to me back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, the on-the-ground development team is the H1 Investment Group. Um, that's uh, Doug and myself and David, and then there's another guy named Paul Crisali who's back there as well, who's a partner of ours. Um, uh, Howard's team is going to do both the civil as well as the, um, uh, the environmental and the permitting uh, work as well, uh, the, the filings that we'll, we'll make. Uh, Jim Green is our attorney. Uh, who else am I missing? Guy Busa is our transportation uh, consultant, Howard Stein Hudson. And we've got a you know, large team. McNamara Salvi is our uh, structural engineer. So we've got a very full team of people. And um, um, so we're very excited to be back here with you tonight. I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to have the, a little bit of, if needed, uh, a little bit of discussion around that model um, and talk through what we've, uh, what we've been working on. But we've spent a long time, uh, probably a year, trying to think through how best we can uh, rework this project and make something happen here. The most important thing is um, we have a group of people who are interested in making this project happen. Okay? And so the two people that you've got in the, in the front row, Kevin Verde and Eva, represent uh, the capital that's behind this project. So we have a project that we think makes sense economically and that can be built. That's the most important thing that we want to make sure that you understand tonight. So Kevin is with uh, the National Electrical Workers Benefit Fund, which is um, a very large pension fund based in DC. And Eva represents um, a family based in, in Europe that is a, a large uh, investor in US real estate. So we've got the capital and plan that we think can, uh, uh, can best make the garage something different than what it is today. So let me start. I'm going to refer, if I could, to the, uh, to the screen over there to the, uh, in the back. Yes, ma'am. Sure. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I've never been accused of being quiet. Uh, the, um, so um, what we have existing today is a, a garage with 2,300 parking spaces. Um, it's a huge garage. It's one of the biggest in Boston. It's not the biggest in Boston. Uh, it also has office and retail of about 280,000 square feet, 283,000 square feet. It was built in 1967, that wonderful period of urban renewal when uh, the architecture was described as brutalist architecture, and that clearly is one of the better representations of that. The site area, this is the best um, uh, uh, part of it for us, is four acres, which is very unusual in downtown Boston to have four acres of, of developable area. Um, and the existing developed area, so this is all of the existing parking, all of the office space, all of the retail today on the site is 1.2 million square feet. Okay? There are, however, very good connections. This is at the center of quite a bit that's going on in Boston and is continuing to go on. So there's the Haymarket train station. We've got the North Station commuter rail not too far from there. Haymarket bus station. We've got the new Sudbury ramp and the new Chardon ramp, which are the entrances to I-93, all of which um, experienced a $14 billion makeover, obviously, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. So we feel we're right at the cross connections of something really important from a transportation and design perspective in, uh, in Boston. We've established a number of principles um, that, uh, that really guide us as we try and think through uh, the project. Uh, the most important thing is to continue to build on the investments already made in the Rose Kennedy Greenway in the Market District. So we want to create a landmark on the Greenway by removing the garage over Congress Street. That's the first and most important thing. Remove the, the unsightly garage that exists over Congress Street out to, uh, to the Greenway. We want to support the principles that the BRA has already firmly established in its Crossroads Initiative and in the Greenway District Planning Study. We want to allow for a dynamic and strong ground floor retail plan that will enhance the city's emerging market district. The market that's coming uh, to the Parcel 7 garage, the, the supermarket that's coming just north of us, all those different pieces are parts that we want to enhance and continue to develop. We want to try and use in a sustainable manner um, the repurposing of this whole urban renewal area and enliven the pedestrian connections, make better connections between the West End, the North End, and Beacon Hill. Very important to us. We want to increase, increase the site's activity. Today it's a site that people uh, kind of travel through, but it's not a place that people travel to or stay, certainly not after 5 o'clock. We want to increase city tax revenue and create construction jobs in today's continually continuing shaky economy. And we want to make sure that um, we leverage the significant transit ac access that I talked about before that already exists so we can become a model for a mixed-use transit-oriented development. We want to schedule the, the construction in phases. This last bullet point at the bottom will ensure the continuous parking supply that exists there today. So, the garage today, 2,300 spaces, you'll hear this theme continuing uh, throughout my presentation. The garage today is 2,300 spaces. It never fills beyond 50% of its current capacity. Never fills beyond 50% of its current capacity. So all of us put up with that unsightly garage and everything that's there, but it never fills past its half its capacity. So as I said, one of the first principles is to remove the unsightly garage over Government Center. 
talking over uh, the, the Congress Street uh, uh, throughway there and really enhance the connections to the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway. Um, and so we think we can produce something like this. When the garage is gone, um, that, uh, that something exciting over Congress Street can happen and make it a much better con a pedestrian connection than it is today. We want to le leverage the phenomenal transit access that exists today. You can see the, in the, uh, the purple circle that's right here. I'll try my little laser pointer. The purple circle that's right there at the green line and the orange line, um, that's the, you know, the spot where the garage is located, and that's a terrific hub of, of transportation. We want to leverage that. We want to make sure that we understand, too, that the site is a linchpin, and we want to make sure that as a linchpin, it makes the connections that I've talked about between the North End, Downtown, West End, Beacon Hill, all those different pieces. And those connections start, obviously, with the Congress Street um, connection that needs to, to be improved by the removal of the garage. But also, too, there's a, there's a newer connection that people follow when they're walking through the garage site out toward the Greenway. Um, many of us make that, that trip today, I would suspect. Um, there are connections that need to, to be improved from Beacon Hill down New Sudbury Street to the North End. That's not a pretty walk today. We think with the, the new project, that, that walk can be much improved. Um, there are connections that people make from the Greenway back over toward the Market District. Um, important that we, we reinvigorate those. And then there are all kinds of sub-connections. There's a connection here at, uh, at Bowker Street that we'll talk about in a second. Um, there are connections all the way through the improved um, North Station District that are really important for us to enhance and to enliven. So here's our existing bus station, obviously not an um, outstanding uh, plaza, although the bus activity that happens here is important to the overall activity in Haymarket. So we want to be sure that, that we're able to, uh, uh, to enhance that and, and more effectively design a, a place for uh, the buses to, uh, to stop. This is Bowker Street, not a very pretty walkway today. Uh, people who, who cut through Bowker Street, as you may know, cut down uh, through this staircase and come along the back of the garage something clearly that we want to improve, an experience that we want to improve. Here's New Sudbury Street. Um, so the, the walk from uh, Beacon Hill is, uh, is best seen here on this slide. Um, New Sudbury Street, and, and I think many people agree, is too wide. Uh, it, was, it was thought of and developed at a different time during urban renewal. Uh, the, sidewalks are need, the sidewalks need improving. And so there's a variety of, of, uh, of improvements that we think we can make, particularly as you look in the upper right-hand slide at the changes that can be made to uh, enliven the sidewalk, make that much more of a pedestrian-friendly walk, and to, uh, to narrow it a bit. This, this side, the, the intersection of Merrimack and New Chardon and, uh, and Congress, is a particularly, uh, I would suggest, bad uh, entrance. We actually, the h one Investment Group is based here in the office space of the garage, so we walk that pretty much every day, going to get a sandwich or whatever down in, uh, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the near station area. So we know this, this intersection quite well. Um, our plan will be to completely revamp the intersection and in particular to change the, uh, the entrance to the garage at that point, which really, I, I think, uh, uh, is a, a drag on that intersection today. We think we can unlock urban vistas or view corridors. This is an important thing as well. You know, if you look at the, uh, the view uh, looking down from Merrimack Street from here, it's blocked by the garage. You can kind of see from Causeway Street the Custom House Tower in the distance, but when you remove the garage, look in that upper left-hand piece, you can get a much better view of the Custom House Tower, which is a, a good example, we think, of, of uh, improvements to the view quarters that can make when the garage is gone. Um, there are certainly all kinds of, of, uh, of projects that have started to happen in this, uh, in this entire neighborhood as well that we think are good harbingers for what can also happen in the future. This is a neighborhood, when I was a kid growing up, it certainly wasn't a residential neighborhood, but it is today. It's fast becoming a, a, a stronger residential neighborhood, and these are just some of the projects that are either planned or have already been completed in the neighborhood. So we want to make sure that we enhance that residential character that is beginning to emerge in this neighborhood. So what you'll see from us is a project that is much more residential in character than maybe existed a year ago. So here's our, our concept. We want to start to unlock the potential of the districts that I've described for you already by making sure that we've enhanced those connections both north and south as well as east and west uh, between neighborhoods and, and key uh, pedestrian corridors that um, we think um, need to be reinvigorated. We want to make sure that we connect specifically the market district. So the coming parcel seven public market garage, the Faneuil Hall market, all those pieces next to the Blackstone block, those I think have been for a generation or more, have been really blocked by the, the barrier of the garage from expanding out toward the, the market district on the north side. And, uh, and some of the plans that the VRA have, have really been uh, at the forefront of trying to, uh, to move along in terms of the, the new market uh, that will happen north of us. So we want to make sure that we enhance that connection. There are clearly um, opportunities for us to make connections to the, uh, the sports and entertainment uh, district that has emerged. That has
to some extent, I guess, always been there for at least 100 years. Um, and then we think we can make uh, even better connections uh, between the residential neighborhoods that exist both uh, in the West End and Beacon Hill, as well as the North End, certainly. Um, as you can see, the residential neighborhood in the North End is obviously bleeding over into the uh, uh, into that uh, North Station District, and, uh, and that's something that, again, we want to try and enhance. So here's how we'll do it. Um, the garage today, as I said, for all of the office, retail, and parking, totals 1.2 million square feet of built area. So that's the existing garage today. The, what we'll do is we will demolish the piece of the garage that extends over Congress Street and out to the Greenway. Okay? So that piece of the garage that we'll demolish is about 600,000 square feet. So we'll cut the remaining piece of the garage approximately in half. Okay? We'll end up by producing a development that looks like this from, from the sky. So we'll have um, approximately 1.2 million square feet of office, a little less than a million square feet of residential, about 750 residential units, 750 people added to that, at least 750 people added to that area. It'll have 600 hotel keys. Uh, it'll end up with 1,000 parking spaces approximately, and it'll end up with a substantial retail component as well. So at the end of the day, after we've removed the, the current garage, there'll be 0.6 of uh, 600,000 square feet of the remaining garage, and we'll add 2.4 million square feet of new construction. And we'll end up with a, with a plan that will recreate uh, or reconnect Congress Street right to the site, which we're excited about. How do we achieve it? So the garage today, I'm going to step forward and just uh, kind of show you this model. If you look at this, this model of the garage, the garage today was built, as, as people may remember, was built first before the office space was built. And the office space really doesn't have any structural, true structural relationship to the garage. In between each of the slabs in the existing garage, there's a clearance uh, in some areas of about 10 feet. So there's an opportunity for us to sink super columns through each of those pieces to build a building while the garage and the space, pieces of the space, continue to operate. That's the most important thing. This is an economically viable proposal because the garage can continue to operate. So what we'll do is, using that principle, we'll add a residential building here first, uh, right at the, the corner that's nearest to the corner of Bowker Street and New Sudbury Street. When we do that, we want to make sure that we make improvements on Bowker Street to make that an outstanding pedestrian corridor. So that staircase, uh, the creation of uh, what we like to call Bowker Green, um, we know that we want to make uh, New Sudbury Street improvements um, along here in New Sudbury and retail improvements and really start to begin to work um, improvements into the bus plaza, the existing bus plaza and try and add retail as, as we can so that in the right away we'll make a clear difference in the pedestrian character of the existing, uh, existing project. We'll then add a second residential building here on the corner of Congress and, uh, and uh, New Sudbury. Um, and this is a building that, again, will enhance with retail and, and uh, begin to cover the garage on this side, so that the garage beginning on this side will disappear from view. We'll then add an office building on the corner where the, uh, the drum is um, on the far side, and the office building um, will have a, uh, a lobby, obviously, ground level, uh, outstanding plaza, and we'll begin to make the intersection improvements and the other pieces that, that I've talked about. Um, and we'll, one, one clear way that we can enhance that is by removing the current entrance to the garage, which is here, and moving around to this side of Bacchus Street, so that this entrance, which is a bit of a free-for-all into that Merrimack Street um, uh, uh, intersection today, will be removed. We'll then take down the garage, uh, the piece that extends over Congress Street and out to, uh, uh, out to the, uh, uh, the Greenway, and that leaves us with an outstanding site that will allow us to extend the Greenway into this site. We're really excited about this, that the Greenway is, as many of you know, at, at this particular juncture, is not very green. Um, there's, this is a ramp parcel, as, as all of you know, and, and to get past that ramp parcel is not a very nice pedestrian uh, experience today. So making these connections through the parcel is really important to us, and making sure that this becomes an outstanding public area filled with retail, uh, a, a hotel, office, and residential. So that's a, uh, a key piece and a key part of the opportunity for us. So let me talk about, um, I know people will want to know, so what are the building heights? Um, and let me just talk about that if I could. The building um, here at the, at the corner is, uh, uh, is proposed to be 420 feet tall. The building here at this corner, which is another residential building, is proposed to be 380 feet tall. This building, uh, the office building, is proposed to be 600 feet tall. And this building is proposed to be uh, 300 feet tall. All of these we've tried to keep within, as I said, 
the guidelines that the VRA established uh, by the Greenway Master Plan, uh, which envisioned buildings in this area of, of those heights. On this side, this building would be 250 feet, this building would be 150 feet, and this building would be 100 feet. Obviously, stepping down as we get down closer to the, uh, uh, to the Greenway and stepping down quite dramatically to make sure that, uh, uh, that we create what could be a really outstanding public uh, plaza. Uh, which one was, tell me the heights of those three again. 600 feet. <coughs> the last three. These ones, 250, mm -hmm. 100, 150. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a, a slide that looks a little boring, but this is the basic structural approach uh, that we'll take. It, it's, it's, you can see on the bottom of it, these are the, the so-called super columns that will stretch through and around the garage that will allow us to build these buildings while the garage continues to operate. It's a really fascinating process, but it is a process that's been already um, undertaken and completed in a variety of different projects. In fact, we are very purposeful in putting this together, this team together. Uh, that includes CBT, McNamara Salvia, and Moriarty. They're just coming from a project, the Atlantic Wharf project, which employed the same uh, technique. Um, all of the recent projects at the Financial Center, uh, the Mandarin, uh, the, uh, the Belvedere Residential, and others, those have all been done you know, through uh, existing garages, so similar technique. And there's a variety of different projects uh, like this throughout Boston. So this is a, a technique that has been tested and is true and is um, certainly employable. One of the most important things for us is to achieve that principle that I described right up front, which is to remove the garage and enhance the public ground at the, at the ground plane. So uh, what we've done here is, is shown people what, the, uh, what, the, what the, the, the exchange can be for uh, the garage disappearing and what the public ground can look like. So here is, uh, uh, is retail. So the pink is retail here and, and throughout and around, okay? The yellow is the lobby of the residential building on this side. The entrance here for the garage continues to exist, or the exit, I should say, up here. And then this is more retail here. This is the entrance into the garage, which exists today. It shifts over slightly, but it will continue to exist. This is the lobby of the second residential building. <coughs> and all along here on Congress Street is retail, which we're really excited about. Um, uh, then through here is the lobby for the hotel. And then the blue here is the lobby for the office, again, with some major retail on this side. New Chardon Street, is, as I think all of us know, really does need some, some retail help, particularly at this juncture. So we're excited about that piece. And then this is obviously the big opportunity here. So if we can squeeze the buses down a little bit, um, our, our basic uh, discussion so far with the MBTA has been to take what are today four bus lanes and see if we can move those to two bus lanes um, to see if we can uh, move that down a little bit. And if we can move down a little bit, the, the existing travel lane as well, that's here, the surface road lane that's, uh, that's right here. We'd love to try and do that as well all to make this more of a pedestrian friendly uh, and calmer area. And that leaves us with a great plaza in through here, which we envision as an outstanding retail corridor with retail on, on both sides. We're excited about that. We want to make sure that using that public realm plan that we enhance the connections that we've described. So making all the connections uh, that we've described through Congress Street, making them from the Greenway all the way back to North Station, all those pieces that we've described, really important principle for us. And um, as we go through and think through the public realm, here's sort of a, a series of before and after shots. So here's New Sudbury Street. Uh, that's the after, let me explain the before again. So here's the before of New Sudbury Street, and here's the after of what it can look like. So here's on Bowker Street, that corner with some retail, where today you know, there's kind of a leftover uh, uh, open space parcel that is part of the police station. There's a stairway. We think we can really enliven that with an outstanding retail um, uh, piece on that corner. Um, Here's obviously Congress Street before and, uh, and what we think it can be afterwards. Obviously recreating the, the, the street uh, uh, lights, fixtures, all those different pieces that, uh, that have existed on Congress Street, make it a much better uh, and more retail and pedestrian friendly uh, place. So we're excited about that. Here's, the, um, here's the, what we call the east parcel, but it's really kind of the greenway parcel on, on this side. So here's the, the bus uh, piece looking from Canal Street. This is a major pedestrian corridor, as people know, not just on Celtics games and Bruins games, but every day as people go back and forth to North Station, that can become that. Um, a retail um, a plaza that can have uh, cafes outdoors. We envision it as two stories of retail. Uh, not always an easy thing to do, but there are plenty of examples worldwide where two-story retail has worked well. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, here's more of that uh, Greenway parcel, the East parcel, with a view of the Custom House Tower in the distance. Um, this is kind of one of the upper floors of, of the hotel or residential. Um, and here are some precedents, some public precedents of 
two-story retail that we think are, are good examples. Here's uh, one piece that's on the West Coast. Um, here are some pieces that are, are European. Um, some others that are, uh, the left is, is from Europe and uh, on the right is, uh, is from elsewhere in the U.S. So there are really nice opportunities, we think, to create outstanding two-floor uh, residential um, uh, you know, uh, developments. So here again, just uh, to sort of get toward a conclusion here, here's the development concept. So here's our finished uh, project. Uh, residential tower here, residential tower here, office tower here, hotel here, hotel here, office, small office here, only about 100 feet tall, and uh, 100 feet, 150 foot tall uh, residential. So when you look up above, the total office is about 1.2 million square feet. Uh, that, on a percentage basis of the overall uh, proposal, is far less than what was uh, what was proposed previously. Uh, this is a, a very heavily residential and uh, hotel and retail project. So we've got 750 residential units, 600 hotel keys. We end up with a thousand parking spaces, significant retail throughout the, the site, um, and all that done with 2.4 million square feet of, of new construction. So here's our our last slide again to reiterate the, the public realm and, and the pieces that we want to try and. Uh, uh, make work. It really is something exciting, and as I said, we're ready to go uh, to make something happen. A word on the schedule. Um, we are a, uh, uh, in the midst of, of uh, completing the work necessary to file the project notification form. We'd like to file that in the fall. We, I suppose one could say you could hurry and try and file it in the summer, but try and respect people's vacations and the rest. We'll file that in the fall. And, uh, and then we'd like to, to move as quickly as we can. We want to build these buildings as quickly as we can. That's our presentation. Yes, when you're talking about phasing, yes. and um, do you have a time frame as to how long each phase will take, and will one finish before the next one begins? The the first phase is the uh, is the residential building here on the on the corner, mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to get to that um, as quickly as we can. So just to to give you a sense of, of the schedule for that, it probably takes us um, at least until. Uh, late winter, spring of next year to finish this process, the, the permitting right. for the overall right. Uh, right. project. And then we need to design that building as, as quickly as we could um, and then begin the process of, of building it. So the design process for that probably takes another maybe six to 12 months uh, to complete the design for that. And then the building process takes uh, probably, you know, 45 to 46 months because there are pieces of the garage that we need to, to reassemble and, and make work a little bit differently. So it, to get to this building, the first building takes, you know, all of that period of time. So then we try and move as quickly as we could through the, uh, the other buildings. So four right to five there. years just for the first building. Just for the first piece, yeah. And then we try and move as quickly as we could for the other uh, buildings okay. right after that. Fortunately, the work that we will do, you know, certainly getting the overall plan completed, you know, getting that year out of the way, that, that certainly doesn't need to be repeated for the other buildings. The planning piece for this building you know, might, might have to be repeated for some of these other buildings. But the make ready part of the garage piece does not have to be repeated as well. So the, the construction time periods for these other buildings is short. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question then? So what is taking all of that into account, when do you anticipate, for example, the work on the east part of the parcel? So give a year. I think the, the answer is we try to get to that as quickly as we possibly can. I mean, this is the first step. So the first piece of this is to try and get the plan permanent. Uh, and to get through it, but you know the the answer is we try and get to that as quickly. So you're going to do one A, one B, one C sequentially before you even get to taking down the east part of the garage. That's right. And each of one A, one B, one C is going to be open before the next one begins. You know you could take them a little more aggressively depending on how the market works, um, certainly. But the um, um, but you know for right now we want to build that first that first building is a very big project. That's a that's a probably a hundred and forty million dollar project. That's a big project for Boston. Next buildings are all in that in that same range. So these are all very large projects to take on. And uh, but we want to get to them as quickly as we can and then move as quickly as we can through that, that process. And that's the tallest building. The tallest building is on this corner. This is the first building. This is the residential building. This How is many units from that first building? First building is about three hundred and fifty units, approximately. Okay. So we deliver it as quickly as we can. Yeah. Uh, Tom, first of all, let me say, I think you learned a lot from the first iteration. You've read, I, can I just say one thing that I said to the VR staff last week? We've read every scrap of information that existed. So for all of you who don't, we, while we're starting over, please don't think that we haven't learned anything. We've read piles and piles of all the filings, everything. So it's quite evident. Yes. A lot, a lot of what you've uh, Just three quick questions. Um, 
one of the things that we had emphasized in our comments the first time around was the need for permeability of the site, you know, removing the barrier and replacing it with a crossroads. Now, clearly you do that in spades east of Cambridge, uh, Congress Street, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how it works around the existing garage west of Congress Street. If you could go through that, that would be helpful. Let me just run through my other quick things. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that we were really interested in was a mix of housing that reflected and reinforced the community that surrounds it in the Beacon Hill North End and West End neighborhoods, and particularly the opportunity to create housing which isn't now possible in those neighborhoods with an emphasis on family housing, for example. Could you give some idea of what kind of mix you're thinking about? And then finally, I don't see any reference to the so-called public parcels, which was a matter for discussion the last time. Could you just, and of course you have a very different project than that, could you just review your thinking yep. about, about that? Let me take the last one first, yep. and then you may have to remind me all of them to be sure okay. that I get them all answered correctly. So the old proposal uh, did involve a proposal to acquire the police station here, and perhaps some of the city parcels here. Our proposal does not involve that. So there are, there's no plans on our part to go over Bowker Street. No plans. We've got now or for the future. Now or for the future. We've got four acres of our own to deal with. Um, so those pieces are are just we don't need them, um, nor do we want them, frankly. Um, the there are pieces as you think through here, though. Uh, you know this is kind of typical for a Boston project. Uh, uh, coming out and rearranging New Sudbury Street, pieces of the sidewalk and, and perhaps the travel lane here on New Sudbury Street, which are public uh, properties. So, but that's kind of typical for a uh, for a public project um, uh, for those pieces. So, but no need for those other parcels that you know that were part of that, that dis discussion last time. Uh, the housing mix and the permeability of the site. Let me let me talk about the housing mix. So so one piece of your answer and uh, Representative Walls and I talked about this mm -hmm. last week. It's okay. Can I sure. relate this? Okay. Yeah. The um, um, Representative Walls's question was. Hey, we've we've really wanted to try and encourage developers to uh, produce three family, uh, three unit, um, uh, three bedroom units. Sorry, three bedroom unit uh, uh, pieces in their project. We're all for that, um, and frankly, we think that three bedrooms are an opportunity for us in this market because they're sort of underrepresented um, in the market. So so far for that building on the on the corner, we've included one entire stack of three bedroom units, um, which are, you know, we we think pretty decent uh, family units as well. Um, certainly we're going to look throughout the entire project to try and make these units as affordable as we possibly can um, and we will also operate under the affordability guidelines for the city of Boston as well so you know we're, we're thinking very much about families and family housing you know throughout the project as well um, permeability so permeability we have spent a lot of time internally trying to think through the you know today one of the things that's interesting Bob you, you know this site as, as well as anybody today there are people who work here in the in the Brook Courthouse who today walk through this pedestrian entrance, come through the second floor of the garage, and kind of cut through, particularly when it's raining out or when the weather's not great, right? So, so there's actually constant pedestrian flow through this, this piece of the site um, today. Um, when we close this entrance in the final configuration, it's hard to, you know, to, to continue to have that, that continued uh, pedestrian access through here. But we continue to try and think through how can we how can we make it permeable? Because we've heard that comment from a couple of different folks. The reality is we have an existing garage on the site and we're doing the best we can to work with these pieces of the garage that will remain. There are certainly are possibilities for pedestrian connections through here, through the hotel lobby, but of course, we also wanna make sure that this maintains as a really strong retail corridor as well. Um, but you know that, that's one piece that's kind of on our mind. Can we make sure that this, this connection from this entrance happens through the, Bauker, the new Bowker Street entrance. That's certainly a possibility as well. Um, and then we want to focus on the connections that we can, can clearly make just at the entrances to the garage or on Bowker Street or here along, along Congress Street. I, I'd suggest that the pedestrian patterns that exist today, you think about what's happened with the big day, you know, who, who could have envisioned what, what would have been the pedestrian habits, you know, before the big dig came down and now the big dig's down and you just, you can't imagine it until it actually happens. But I'd suggest that people will feel very differently about walking through or past this site 
when this is completed anyway, and they'll find their own way through nicer paths, it seems to me. I mean, if, you've got, if you're not rushing to a meeting and you're coming from here, you might not cut through here, you might, you might cut through here. Yeah. You know, this is, a, this is a nice spot. That's really wonderful. Yeah. Really a wonderful proposal, if I may say so myself. You did wear it, and I see that you did read all the comments, and I'm glad to hear you say we are talking, just so we're you know, on the same page, primarily using the government center garage. Well, whereas in the other proposals that we got, it was very difficult for the IAG to compare apples to apples because out of the three options that appeared previously, it was option one, two, or three, if they were able to get the, the NSTAR project, if the BRA was willing to give up the land there or the impossible six. But I think, I mean, my thing is we don't want to spin our wheels once again. We want to know that, you know, with your investment team, with the development team, because previously they said if they only developed the government center garage, it was not economically feasible. I'm sure, Tom, under your leadership, and you've done all the numbers and you worked this out, that what you're presenting is, in fact, feasible. And I think the city should have some sort of guidelines that when they do go through these proposals, that there is definitive, definitive action to show that whoever is going forth with this project doesn't have the, have, does have the economic and the financial backing to start <coughs> something and then conclude it. That's, I guess, really, I, I, I really commend you. And it would be great to see this activity back in that area. And I'm glad to hear about uh, three bedroom units because it's so terribly lacking, especially in the North End. And uh, I commend you, and uh, I think you're doing a good job. I'm glad you took the time to listen, as I know you would. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. I, I appreciate it. Proposal. Well, thank you to all of you. I, I should have said at the outset for you guys to take time on a July day. I really appreciate you mm -hmm. being here. It's, um, we, we have tried to learn a lot of those lessons. Thank you. Do I understand then that none of the parking will be below grade? It'll it will remain above that's grade correct. as it is today. That's so correct. that's an expense that was not that was there before. It's not there anymore. That's correct. So the, the parking that exists today right. in kind of this central core area will disappear from the eye. So as you're as you're walking, we'll wrap the entire garage with these uses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you won't see it for the retail, for the housing on this side, for the hotel pieces on this side. It'll disappear. Um, but it will exist in the inside the building. Um, so that will remain the same height, the, that piece of it will remain the same height as it is today. Correct. And then, oh, sorry, here. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. and then the, the office space will remain where it is today? Well, we're working That's, through that proposal. Okay. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll leave the office space where it is today. But one of the things that we really want to focus on, I had a slide in here that I probably buzzed by without talking about it is, is this, when we do this, it leaves us with a quite large roof here yeah, at the top. Exactly. And so producing at that level, now now today there are 11 stories, okay? So there's two stories of, of office. There's a 10th floor and an 11th floor of office. So the question is, um, do we produce that, that green roof on top of that 11th floor of office? Or you know, how do we make that work with the, with the existing mm -hmm. space that's there? Um, but we definitely believe that there's a great opportunity to create this sort of garden at that level. So this this we think of as a great green space at this top, at this top, which can be a terrific amenity for uh, both the people who live in, in these two buildings as well as for the hotel here. So it can be a great space uh, that, frankly, as people go into the hotel, members of the public could could share. So it's nice. Tom, uh, is a thousand cars a thousand out as we can park adequate and appropriate. And so we can on. we can park the uses that we're proposing. So the 2.4 million square feet of additional uses with a thousand cars, we can park it. What what is um, what also bears you know stating after that is uh, there's also a desire by a variety of people for us to continue to park the transient parkers, the, the daily parkers. Now because we're proposing something that's much more residential than office. Then we've got you know some off hours that allow us during the course of the day we think to uh, accommodate uh, many of the transient parkers who today park there. Okay, we're still going through the analysis, but it's multiple hundreds of parkers we can park in that building um, uh, during the day. It just occurred to me that where the two office floors have been added, those could in fact be two additional parking lots. That's one of the things that's on our mind. Certainly, yeah. I think once you get to the tenth floor. If you go above the 10th floor, you're stretching how far people want to drive, yes. you know, to get to their parking space. Yeah. So, you know, but we, 
but we're definitely continuing the study of whether or not the 10th floor becomes a parking floor. So one further I... question? Yes. And I, this is not coming from me, but from constituents. Uh, there was a good deal of discussion about a public school in, in phase one of the discussion of the redevelopment of the garage. Is that something that it's has not. any relevance? What, one of the lessons we learned, Ms. Gannon was sort of, sort of suggesting this, one of the lessons we learned was it's not possible for this project to be all things to all people. This is a project, and this, we've got a firm uh, proposal for you. This is not a project that includes a school, um, and, uh, uh, and that's it, period. Uh, but we do have what we think is a good viable project, and, uh, and it can move forward and, and be built uh, quickly. Can I just follow up on the parking, not on the structured parking, although I will remind you that was one of the most controversial elements of the early discussion of this project, how much parking there should be. Uh, and I would just raise the issue with regard to the garage parking of whether your 50% applies to garden events, because that's when uh, yes. you know, the rock meets the hard place. Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup finals? Yes. Well, no, more than, we, no more than 1,300 spaces were filled. Really? No more okay. than 1,300 spaces. That's There's a period of time, okay, at say from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 o'clock, okay, when we get to that 1300 number, that's the absolute peak when we've got some office people remaining and some you know, new partners coming into the Bruins or the Celtics. But we never go over that, even for you know, Bruins playoff games. That's right. um, and then of course, when the office workers bleed out, then it goes well under that. So, so it, you know, we, we know that garage, we've, but I will tell you, from an HYM perspective, we've learned more than parking. <laughs> There are some so, unpleasant surprises. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Parking's like, a pretty good business, I will tell you, it's, but it, it's tough to manage. It. Our real question has to do with on-street parking. Yes. I love the new Sudbury Street plan. Yes. What have been the nature of your discussions with the Boston Police Department? <laughs> we, we've so, had none so far. Uh, <laughs> but the, but our, our plan would be to offer free parking for uh, the police officials and the district attorney's office uh, people who park on that street. We would offer free parking inside the garage for those folks. Because that's actually been a rather intractable problem. I understand. We actually have a early stages on the design, but we actually have what we think is a nice uh, place, nice spot for those spaces right on the first floor. So. Uh, Tom, my concern is the concept of near the north end where there's a lot of pedestrian movement, people twice a day commuting, getting to the subway. Yes. And as you know, we've got that ugly hole in the ground there, you know, yes. Castle 6. Yes. And of course, a lot of us in the north end would love to have the cover, you know, ramp cover so that you increase the circulation, make it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But since we know that doesn't seem feasible, but my concern is when you're doing the construction, mm -hmm. how are they going to, to get to the circulation, so that station, to the, you know, you were saying you're going to squeeze the buses, maybe, and yeah. I'm concerned about the logistics of all the buses, and when you, again, the conflict between the pedestrians and the vehicular, because you've got adding office space, you've got the hotels, you're going to have all these different vehicles, limos, more taxis, uh, delivery trucks because of the retail, and also all the MBTA maintenance vehicles, not just buses. Yes. And I'm concerned about the people rushing to get to the subway, and you know, the nice plaza and all that. So it's like you're inviting people to circulate, and yet I'm always afraid that there's a conflict with trying to get the logistics of the space for the vehicles. So there's there's two pieces of time that are important in answering your question. There's the sort of demolition and construction period, yeah. and there's the finished period when it's all said and done. Let me do the easier one first. So the finished period, when it's all said and done, we, we propose to leave the head house, the MBTA head house, here, which is in its approximate location, um, you know, toward the, uh, uh, in the middle of, the, of that plaza. We kind of like that from a pedestrian perspective. We like the fact that there's a lot of pedestrian activity around that, around that head house, and we want this to be a very active public area. So, so we're kind of good with that. As you may know, there's another entrance into that station here at the Parcel 7 Garage. So, so when you come up out of the green line in particular, you can kind of come up out of either spot. The orange line, when you take the orange line from, uh, from, here, from this direction, I think you can also come from both spots. Coming from uh, Charlestown, I think you can also come up from both spots as well. So um, preserving those access points in the finished condition is important to us, really important. Squeezing the buses down in the finished condition, we certainly, I think the MBTA will be, 
very you know big defenders of the service, the bus service that comes in. There's uh, there's two main lines, bus service, and, and you may know the the definition of the Haymarket bus stop is actually broader than just this place. There are a series of of bus stops that are Haymarket bus stops in, in this area, uh, but there are two specific lines that come in here today, um, and we we've, we've we've done the beginnings of a lot, quite a bit of study, and of course before there was a lot of us a lot that we could read about about this this piece. And we believe that it's possible to squeeze these down to two and not affect service at all. So we, you know, that, that's our initial thought. So in the finished condition, we want to make sure that the pedestrian connections here to the existing headhouse are strong and available. And we want to make sure that the pedestrian connections to the, the buses are strong and available as well. So the key part to your question, I think, is what happens during construction, all right? During construction, the first statement really is, um, and I'm sure the MBTA, if they were represented here, would say would be jumping out of their sneakers and standing up and saying this. All work around these kinds of places will have to happen off hours. This will be part of what makes this piece of the project a little expensive. Is this is this is work that needs to happen, you know, af af well after midnight. Probably. So, um, so the work around that will happen off hours, and uh, and by the time people get up and get ready to go to work, it'll have to be ready in, in a certain level. So we'll have by the time we get to there a very uh, specific agreement with them about how we'll phase this, how we'll take pieces down, how we'll you know, keep the headhouse operative. You know, who knows how it'll all play out when, when all is said and done. Um, but I, I can tell you that it'll have to happen off hours and there will always be preserved access for people to both this headhouse and that as well as the buses. Uh, I'd also like to have you get more statistics from the MBTA because when the project's finished, you're going to have all these people getting out of work, more people using the public transit than now. Plus, they're supposed to extend the green line. So I'm thinking in the future, will this become a choke point where people, we, we brought this up before, people get very frustrated. They get out of work, they try to rush down to get the subway, yeah. and then the subway's coming, they're already full. You know, the trolley's the capacity and the orange line. So, Maybe it so, won't be a problem. Maybe not. But. Well, uh, two or three pieces to that. Um, first, we, we, we saw that comment letter, and you know, so we raised that issue with the MBTA. They sort of looked at us like, you know, are you kidding? They, they basically think that there's plenty of capacity in the lines today um, for all of the people who exist, as well as the people who are, who are coming in. Um, the green line. The green line. The, I would say that we know the green line pretty well because we have another project on the green line. But the, um, There's capacity on the green line. Well, I will tell you the, the pitch point for the green line. You and I both know is over by Park Street. Right. Like, yeah, the, right. the green line uh, pitch point is not here. It's really on that on that on that uh, Park Street piece. I'm presuming when they do the green line extension, which is a billion dollar project, there'll be some attention paid to that you know to that pinch point there. Um, but the, the T staff, I, I can't. I'm not the train guy for the T, so I can't defend. But the T staff was pretty strong with us that that there's there's ample capacity on both the green line and the orange line to, to service this project. Um, a number of us ride those trains every day, um, and um, I, I I agree with you that the pinch point at Park Street on the green line is a frustration for all of us. But the orange line seems to me to have plenty of capacity. I have to say I'm glad that the shelter will stay there. The police station will still be there. I'm a little disappointed that the school is not going to be there. So I'm hoping that you come back with something that will be helpful to the community in general. Thank you. Um, will the sidewalks then, where people wait for the buses today? Yes. People wait in the road because there's no room off the sidewalks, especially that little island there for the buses that are on the far side. Will that be expanded to make more room for people to wait? I mean, how else do you know? Or is that up to you or up to the MBTA? I, I would think there'll be a lot of give and take between ourselves and the MBTA as to how we'll, we'll, we'll work that through. And so we're at an early stage of that with them. So the answer is we'll, we'll continue to work on that with the MBTA and make that work. I, I think the one thing we know is that for both people who are taking the buses today as well as ordinary pedestrians who are walking through there, that configuration of the buses and the, and the, uh, the islands Really, it doesn't work at all. So we want to try and search out a better solution. We do want to try and make sure that the pedestrian character here, so this this spot that where people walk across from Canal Street coming this way, we think this is a terrific opportunity to make this a great pedestrian connection here. So at some point, you know, you have to really think through all this is a it's a finite amount of space, you know, from here to here, right? 
So we want to make sure that this is a wide enough pedestrian car uh, uh, corridor uh, through here that allows good retail, um, nice outdoor seating for restaurants and the like, because this can be outstanding through Connecticut, right? So if, you, if this is a finite area, then we have to really think through the design of this. I mean, this was today designed for a totally different time, 30 or 40 years ago. So thinking about the usage today and all those things, it can be differently designed. And we keep talking about commuters, and when I, we're, I think in my head, most of us probably feel the same way. We think about office workers, nine to five people. If you walk down that area in the evening, you'll know that they're not office workers. They are people who are doing maintenance. They are people who are doing janitorial work. They're other people who are still commuting, but it's not nine to five. Yeah. They're a, a different hours because those buses at night are busy. Yes, they are. And they're going to many places. Yeah, we, we work uh, right here. Our office is yeah, right here. Right. So we so we see it and, yeah. and we understand it. Yeah. And we continue to study it. So we're going to try and come up with a solution. As I said, we're not. We, we love. We want to embrace the fact that this is a, 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 a huge crossroads for MBTA, mm -hmm. and, and we think that's a huge uh, benefit for the site. So we want to make sure that you know the the orange line and green line connections here are enhanced, and that the bus connection is enhanced. And we we think these are these yeah. are good things. Tom, um, just a reminder that great public space actually has a fairly long and distinguished history. That was Haymarket yeah. Square. Yes, it was. And and in fact, um, I see that your parcels are vaguely triangular there. Yes. I take it that's to evoke the Little bit of a notion. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think if if, if uh, Mr. Bergman were making this presentation, he would he would have made the appropriate historical <laughs> reference. <laughs> the, um, yeah, it's it's um clearly that's our, our notion is to is to is to think about what this place was. In the earlier slides I didn't dwell on it too much, but it, it is you know this area was once a huge hub of activity, as, as you well know, and, and so we think it can uh, can be again, and uh, so that's what we're trying to achieve. Do you think they'll try to preserve that circle in the granite? I don't know. It, uh, that can be <laughs> some, there's probably know, some historian, some people may want to try to preserve. I ask you to. There's probably, to preserve probably you and me and maybe 25 other people who know what that circle is. Yeah. Because it's, it's, no, no, no. it's not marked there. I'm not, I'm not no. old enough. <laughs> but it's, Almost. Yeah, we. <laughs> but we go and you know we stand in that circle and try to think it through and all yeah, the pieces. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, certainly the acknowledgement of that and that location is an important uh, thing for us in the future to make sure that people understand why it's been there and why it's important that it be, you know, a key pedestrian character in an area of commerce like that. Bob, the only reason I mention this is because just down the road there they put the things that symbolize the canal. Yes. And those yeah. People, and they were doing a big yes. dig, so they were trying to emphasize some historical connections. I have even read cover to cover my history of the Middlesex Canal. <laughs> yes. Yes. We are well read on the history of, of the area. Yes. Can I, I want to come back to the housing. I'm delighted to hear about the three bedrooms, as you know, because there's a tremendous shortage of housing that will accommodate families in the area. Can you give a little more detail on the, the kinds of units? Is it condo, rental, on-site affordable, off-site affordable, and just elaborate a little bit on what your plans are. This is definitely a rental project today. Um, all the, all the, everything's all rental? All the units would, these units here that I'm pointing at. On this, it's the first building. This first building, yeah, is yeah. definitely yeah. Rental. Yeah. rental, okay? Yeah. Uh, the second building is rental, okay? Um, then once you get to this side, mm -hmm. this is a, a pretty strong residential building. Who knows where the market is at that point, but this is, you know, something that, in my mind at least, could go either way. Um, but for the most part, these are, are rental, residential units. Okay. Um, the, um, sorry, And the, the last question was your plans for the affordable housing on-site or off-site? Right now we're, we're modeling it with the units uh, on-site. Reserve the, the ability, though, to have a discussion about how we might best contribute to the affordable housing fund. Uh, and will it just it'll be not just but will it be eighty percent units as affordable, not anything more? Do you know? Well, the typical in, in, in right. Boston, right. what happens is it's a fifteen percent requirement for affordable. No, I, I understand that. I live at West End Place. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a, a range of affordable. Eighty twenty. Yeah. yeah. Pieces of West End Place were done with a different financing yes. model. Yes. Eighty twenty uh, financing yeah. model. Yeah. And then we've got fifty percent units too. Yeah, so, so for new, this is likely not an 80-20 model, so this would be a, a so-called market rate development with 15% affordable as part of the, the city of Boston guidelines. Right, and then um, just to add on, the, the level would be 70% of the area to be income is what the executive order calls for, 70% mm -hmm. of the area, area median income for rental units right now. Okay. <coughs> Get back to that parking 
mean, so mm -hmm. the parking structure is going to stay as a common accessible point from office and hotel and residential? Yeah, I, 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 is your question, would they be reserved spaces? or? No, they, my question is, so you're not going to be building any more parking for the office building. They're going to use these, they're going to... Correct. I mean, I think one, one initial thought that we've had is as we build the, the office building, at the lower floors of the office building, there's some opportunity for us to add a little bit of parking in, in this in this section above. So this is, so this is you know, third floor and above uh, okay. the garage. So there's some ability to add a little bit of parking here. But for the most part, the parking here in the, in the middle, um, you know, obviously we improve it to make it a nicer experience for people who are driving in a parking. Right. Plus there's ex an extensive amount of work that's required to set the garage up, redo the ramp structure to, to make so all that all work. Pretty much. Pretty, there's, there's a lot. You, you, when you drive into it in the finished condition, you won't recognize it in the same way. It, the ramp structure will be different to all those different pieces. And so the hotel will share in that? Yes, that's right. As well? that's right. All of these uses can share in that parking. Except, I assume, across Congress Street? There's the, the uses here could certainly share in that parking. I mean, really, this but parking. Would be parking for those, especially down here. this residential? This one? Would there be any individual parking in that building? All of these uses, so the 2.4 million square feet of additional uses on the site, there's enough room to park those uses in this garage, in the thousand space garage. So all those uses, you know, here, I, I would assume that for the hotel, this is probably Valley Park. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, the, the residential might be ballet parked as well. Uh, but what we've calculated is, thinking through all these uses, that there's enough room to park that project in this garage. In that I mean, really what this ends up, well, this remains a, a public garage. Mm -hmm. This is still a, this is a public garage for people to pull into. Um, and what happens is, you know, people who come to the office will pull in. Um, and uh, people who are staying at the hotel, people who are, you know, living in the residential uh, units will, will pull in as well. So the same kind of experience of, you know, charging a monthly rate or a daily rate for people who pull into the, to the garage. Will you keep the zip cars? Love to have more zip cars. I mean, I think Good. the premise is that, you know, a lot of the people who live in these units today, these kinds of rental units yeah. today, don't want to own a car. Right. It's, it's a pain in the neck for them in terms of, you know, driving the city, parking it, insuring it, doing all that sort of stuff. So the zip cars have taken on because people have a different attitude about cars. So we want to encourage that in a big way. Yes. Again, I guess we're hung up here on the evidence, but uh, when you talk about the parking for the cars, I'm concerned the circulation for, again, we've got residential, but you've also got the hotel. Where do the limos go, the tour buses, and all the taxis? Because you don't want to have them double parking or pulling yeah. up quick to drop people off. And now that you're opening Congress Street and these others, mm. you've got to keep the flow of regular traffic. You've got tour buses backed up. Where do they go? It's a good question. Uh, tour buses. Really don't, you know, I mean, they're not, are you suggesting that tour buses would come to this site and load, let they people off and then we'll stay? Because of the hotel more than anything else. I'm concerned about the limos for when they have special events at the hotel plus the tour bus. I mean, can I make a suggestion on that? Maybe at a, maybe we do an IAG meeting where we specifically talk about transportation pieces and, and all those Logistics. kinds of things. Is that, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, exactly. We'd be happy to do that. Because if the ground floor doesn't work, nothing else does. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. It's, and, and I think, you know, on those pieces, there's a lot of detail around it that, that I would sort of invite a, a, a really detailed working session to think through how we, we make those work. Okay. Thank you. Tom, two quick questions. I assume you'll be surrendering hundreds, maybe thousands <coughs> plus spaces back to the parking. It's an interesting. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, it, I've been trying to think about this now. So, so our investor group who's here. I mean, I you know, there's value in those office spaces. That we're putting back into that like that, right? Um, but the problem is, it's like you know, like you know, it's a little bit similar to the trade of pollution credits, which really hasn't taken on, right? So, but there really isn't a market for the trade of of the right to build a space right now. So. For right now, it could be. For right now, we have not assigned a value to it, but it's clearly a public benefit, right? I would suggest that, that we're taking a thousand spaces and putting them back into the. the Second, like with regard to the existing office space, how long do you expect that that will continue to be available, and what is the occupancy rate there now? We we have uh, put one state tenant in there, uh, about fifty-five thousand square feet, and we're in discussions with a, a few other tenants. And what we're trying to do with the leasing is to
focus kind of on this side of the building is a little bit of a paradox in there. Uh, keep the, the lease terms limited and as short as possible um, for that. Uh, but we're trying to focus on this side so that when those lease, once we completed these pieces and those lease terms come out, then this garage can immediately come down. So that's kind of where we are on that. The reason I ask, and I there is a material motive, yes. um, it's very interesting and affordable interim use space, mm. uh, especially if it isn't otherwise occupied. Mm -hmm. And back to Martha's issue. Um, the elementary school is looking for this kind of interim space here, there, and everywhere. And it occurs to me this might be an interesting opportunity for that until permanent plans for a new elementary school are put in place. I don't know whether the, the space is suitable or the timing works, but it's an interesting possibility. It's hard for us to, for me, to envision how that drop off would work for elementary school. You know, you get drop the kids out, work the elevators, do whatever, the life safety systems, the, all those different pieces. Um, we want to be helpful, as helpful to the city as we possibly can. Um, but one of the principles that we bring you know, to the table this time around is we also want to be very careful to not be all things to all people. We are we're a real estate project on land that we own. We want to try and make this thing work as, as best we can. So we talking a five year sort of time frame now tomorrow? I, you know, I, the, are there are there going to be interim you, you know interim tenants and uses? Yes, there will be. You know, if, and if, if we can be helpful somehow, if not the school, you're open to those possibilities. <coughs> That's correct. That's correct. I almost wish we could push to have the ramp cover over there. I know. I <laughs> you know the only reason I'm saying that is because during all the construction, you could have the a lot of the pedestrians detour. They could walk. It's safer because. The way it is now, and you're trying to squeeze, and you're trying to do all that construction, where do the people go? This way, they have a safer, better place to walk, still close to where they go now. I think, um, Peter, can I talk a little bit about the study? Okay, so I, I think that the BRA is planning this fall to try and engage a study of that ramp parcel and the other ramp parcels as well. So I would expect that we will play an active role in those ramp parcels and how they get covered. I'm well aware of the history, well aware of all yeah, the different pieces. I'm frustrated. I, 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 yeah. I wasn't thinking of a park so much as we'd like. I was yeah. thinking more of the logistics of safety for the pedestrians during the construction. It's a, it's a really bad, it's a tough, tough pedestrian spot today, right? I mean, as a pedestrian, there's no room for it, really. Yeah. In that, in that Just for the record, I am bring up the covering of the ramp possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty. No low contendo. <laughs> it's fine to bring it up where we're out, but it's safe. From what Tom said, we will be working with the Department of Transportation to, turn, to determine the next vision for the three ramp parcels, specifically 18, 12, and 6. Um, 18, for instance, is working pretty well as an open space parcel. Does that satisfy any of uh, either the, the public um, intent of, the, of that site? Uh, and does it satisfy the environmental commitments to the federal government, for instance? Clearly, 12 and 6 are different. They serve different purposes. But they need different solutions. So we need to, now that there are no civic institutions planned, uh, we need to rethink that. We will commence that this fall. I will say, however, the parcel 18 is the only one of the three RAM parcels that has greatly exceeded expectation. <laughs> it really does work well as a landscape parcel, which many of us were very skeptical about. And neither of the other two uh, have lived up to their uh, dreams. So 18 is not a bad example. You don't want to talk about grandpa. No. <laughs> if we can talk about decorative railing that's not on 18, <laughs> that's going to exist in the other two parcels. So, okay. I, but I do think, and I think Peter is right on target, and I know, and I know the BRA has, in fact, moved in that direction, for which he is what is a very great thing. Falco Street is not going to be open, is that correct? For vehicular, you know, we clearly want it to be a <laughs> pedestrian it. access point, yes. yes. But for okay. vehicles from Bowker to New Sudbury right. Street, no. Okay. Uh, any uh, speculation about the low rise portion of the JFK huh, complex? Interesting. No speculation. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, in an earlier life, I, I spent a lot of time <laughs> studying that low rise. Um, so I mean I, um, you know, it's a, um, it's it's clear that they're starting to think through the uses that have gone in there. So I, 
But I know speculation as to what happens with that film. That could have come at school. <laughs> For example. I stepped away from that. <laughs> That's going to be, you got to talk to the President, I think. The President of the United States for that one. Um, do any of the IAG members have more questions, comments? Yeah, I'll just say Okay. So I think at this time, um, well, Christine, can we possibly get a copy of this presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we can take a PDF version of this and send it to you, Christine, if that's yeah. okay. And you I can think, provide it to anybody. Sure. Whatever you send a link to the IAG, and then I'll post it um, yeah. on the BRA's website, so it'll be accessible to everyone. And I'm sure we'll we'll post it on our website as well. Sure. So, you know. We just go to um, BRA's website, and then you can filter by um, development projects and by neighborhood. So I think we have this project listed under downtown, north end, west end, and Beacon Hill. So you can, you'll be able to find the link. There. And Tom, what is your website? Uh, uh, HYMinvestments.com. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I think with that, we'll open it up for questions and comments. And again, if you could please identify yourself and say what you're talking about. Uh, Sean Sanger from the North End. I guess when you had your conversation regarding uh, the loading and unloading of the vehicles, I think the plan looks great and it looks, you know, all sides from the exterior look amazing, but how do you deal with the loading, unloading, the service, the dumpsters, all that kind of necessary city stuff? And how does that impact pedestrians as you're walking around the perimeter? And I noticed you've got the two access points to get to the garage. I'm on the one side, but there's obviously going to be a lot more interruption to the pedestrians and how does that work. So when you get to that point, you really yeah. we've spent a lot of time on it already. And, and as you know, it's 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 tough. There's some constrictions on, on this uh, parcel, the, the Greenway parcel, the east parcel. Um, there are two tunnel boxes that are right underneath there, the, the green line and the orange line tunnel boxes. So it's very hard to go down below um, as a result of that. So we're trying to think through where the appropriate loading is um, for this. For right now, as kind of a placeholder, we thought of the loading for this building um, to be here and the loading for this building to be here. We're still tr struggling a little bit about exactly how to load this building. There may be you know, some subterranean ways that we can make a connection between these buildings, perhaps even under Congress Street, who knows? I mean, there's, we're trying to think of every different way to make this work, but the, but the subsurface constrictions that exist here are tough um, for us. Um, on this side, um, the, the basic loading for the office building and for the hotel would happen here off of Bakker Street. You can see the, uh, there are the trucks uh, back in there. Um, so that loading actually works quite well um, for us. Uh, and uh, and we've, you know, we've measured it and thought through on Bakker Street. So that actually works okay. What becomes, which still involves uh, quite a bit of discussion on our side is how to load this side of that project because the garage at this uh, level with the ramp systems and the things that exist today um, don't allow us to get a truck through the garage over to this side, at least not right now, as far as we've been able to tell. So we continue to work on that. For now, what we've shown is some loading here at this spot, not a preferred you know, route for us because we're working so hard to make the Sudbury Street better, so it's not preferred, but somehow we do need to figure out how to load these buildings on this side, so we continue to work on it. But great question, you, you were on it. The woman in the back. Yes, hi, Jane Kelly from Beacon Hill. Could you, a two-part question, could you please locate on the map again the office building on New Chardon Street? So the office building is here on New Chardon Street. And that's New Chardon, and then going west is Bowker? This is Bowker Street here. Okay. And that's 600 feet? This is 600 feet here, yes. Could you uh, give a couple of examples of buildings in Boston now that are 600 feet? Well, the way, we, the way we thought this through actually was this was um, in keeping with uh, uh, the Greenway Master Plan that established the heights for that site. So, so we really weren't thinking about other buildings in Boston. Um, we were really trying to think about the planning uh, uh, principles that were laid out for this area. Um, that's how we thought about it as a 600-foot building. Other buildings that are 600 feet, what do you think, Richard? What's that? Richard, what do you think? We're the Hancock and the Prue are south, north of seven. Oh, the Hancock is uh, 800 feet. Yeah. No, Prue is much higher than that. Prue's like uh, Prue's like 750. Probably, uh, I would say like 60, 60 state probably. Yeah. That is lower than what was proposed by the previous plan. Yeah, I'd say the old plan was 820 feet. Like 800 feet. Yeah. and then seven something. Yeah, the old plan was 820 feet. Quite lower than the original plan. 
Uh, that's probably about 44, 45 stories. And how tall is the JFK? Excuse me? The JFK is how tall? The JFK light? The, the, no, the, the, the building. building. Oh, the JFK yeah. building? That's yeah. about 400 feet. Okay. Sorry. We have the old, old uh, RFP. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, Mayor. Oh, I, I, I represent the only uh, building on Balco Street, so thank you, thank you, thank you for giving our building a <laughs> um, we, we are on 22 years into a 99-year lease with the city, so we're looking forward to seeing another proposal in 77 years from now. But, um, we talked a little bit about Balco Street because we, we're one of the top sites for the ride, and we actually get lots of deliveries. We have our one little commercial space and the rest is taken by our neighbors, the police department. So how will that affect our operations since we, uh, we're in the building uh, just five years a week? Can we come see you this week? Absolutely. Okay. We get nervous when people walk through the building with clipboards and are measuring. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come see you. So, Joe, myself, David, we'll come see you this week. Is that okay? Uh, but we're, we're very, we're very uh, uh, appreciative to the city. We work with people with disabilities, and our main concern was that we'd be losing our so thank you very much for not thinking about us. <laughs> we know you're there. We definitely do. But we've been trying hard to be smart about all the different pieces. We don't want to get in front of this meeting. So we wanted to get this meeting done and then go see yeah, people who are on it. Yes, we understand that. So, but we want to be a, we are, we think a pretty good neighbor. We want to be an even better neighbor. So we'll come see you this week. Okay. Stephanie Ho, North End Waterfront. <clears throat> Um, it's probably a little early, but I want to ask about uh, shadow impact because it, it affects the north end in two ways. First of all, I think there's going to be a section of the north end that currently enjoys sunlight at some point during the day in the winter that could be affected. And also there are two greenway parcels um, that aren't really shown on your map, but they're very, very popular with the residents, with families with children, especially at this time of the year with the fountains and a lot of people that use them in the evening. Mm -hmm. It already gets some shadow from the current um, parking garage, and I'm wondering if you can speak particularly about those pieces um, closest to surface road in comparison to the current building, and then if you've got any shadow information already on some of these towers. As, as part of the process, We'll study shadow, so that's that's a key piece of what we'll do. So I, I really can't comment now until we've completed those those shadow studies, but um, but we will complete those, and I'm sure we'll you know be back in this room having a discussion about shadows. <coughs> that's for sure. Um, Jeff, you're Yeah, in answer to that question, what I've focused on is, is um, what it takes to get this first building going. And yeah. then really what we want to do from there is, is roll through these other buildings as, as quickly as we can um, to get to the finished condition. So um, really our, our first objective is to get to this first building as quickly as we can. The, the, the market in, in Boston is better, mm -hmm. but not 100% you know, better than, than where it was. We're still not at you know, not at, a, at a time when, when jobs are being added by the hundreds or, or any of those sorts of things. It's, it's getting better. It is a good time to build a residential building, and so we want to take advantage of that window now and build as quickly as we can. So you said the first building will take up. about four to five years? To complete, yes. To complete. <coughs> to complete, yeah. Right, can I follow up? Because I've asked this question, now she's asked this question, and I'm going to ask it again, and hopefully the third time will be the charm, and we'll actually get an answer, <laughs> which is, how long is this going to take? I'm sure you are sophisticated developers and have a timetable. I can't imagine you don't. So let me take another shot. Here's, I, I'm answering the question as best I can, Representative. I know, the but, time but, table but you're is, not giving us a timetable other than for the first building. And I'm trying to figure out, are no, we talking because, that this is going to be done in 10 years? Is this going to be done in 15 years? When do we anticipate because, we're going to get done? Because I think what you want from us is constant forthrightness. And that's when I'm, I'm being completely forthright with you, right? We want to get to the finished condition just as fast as, as you want to get to the, to the finished condition, right? But the one piece that we can most easily define today is that first building. We know it takes, we know it takes um, uh, probably 12 months to get to this, just the process that we're in right now. 
Um, and then once you get through that process, you need to design the building, you need to build that building, and then we want to roll as quickly as we can through the other buildings. So that's the one piece that we can define today. That's the one piece. We want to build it, though, as quickly as we can. I think one of the bigger concerns that most of us have, I know I do, is how long are we going to live under construction because we've got so much more going on around us. I think that's the part of the issue. We've got not only this project, but we've got a... We've got some potential within the North Station area. We've mm. got some, you know, the West End has the yeah. uh, equity garage that we're looking at too. So there's a lot of other construction. How many, how many, how many years are we going to have dirty windows? Well, how, let me, let me. Can I answer it this way? Let me. Yeah. This is our first meeting, okay? And yeah. we'll try and think yeah. about how better we can help. <coughs> I'm completely sensitive to that, to mm -hmm. that answer or to that question, and you know, to to try and give you a, uh, as direct an answer as we can. So let me try and think about it a little bit more, and at our next meeting, I'll, I'll answer that question. And just a quick follow-up to the representative. Is there any time frame, just as she said, you are uh, well-respected uh, developers, there must be some sort of estimation. When would you think you would probably take down the garage that over goes, goes over Congress Street? It's the same, that it's the same piece of it, right? So let me let me think about it a little bit more, and we'll next come back. Next, have that open during construction yeah, until yeah. they finish in the first phase. No, I agree. I guess my question from what they're asking about the scheduling and so forth. If I understand this correctly, maybe I'm a little naive here, but you're presenting this entire project and with the IAG. Yeah. But the Article 80, are you trying to get a building permit for the whole project Correct. regardless of the schedule? Now, Correct. you build the housing and certain things, but then you're <coughs> planning to just keep going. A little different, I think. Yes, the answer is that uh, that we expect that there'll be a, a, an approval for the entire project, right? But I certainly expect that within the context of that of that permitting process, we'll have a very detailed discussion about this schedule, about exactly this this question. So, what I'm suggesting to you is that our next meeting will have you know a more detailed discussion about that. Okay, because I think what was confusing us when you were saying like the one building would take like a year just to go through some of the things. Yes. And I'm thinking, well. Could be still wanting to design and be doing a lot of work on the other buildings, sure. but that would include the Article 80 stuff. Yeah. So. yeah, I agree. I agree. But you're trying to lump it all into one thing. I mean, the answer, the answer is we want to get to this finished condition just as fast as everybody else does. Here, right? Okay. Well, that's but the, you know, there are pieces good. that you need to, to to try and be forthright about, which is it takes a longer through this process than to design it, and then these buildings are very complicated. Even though I'm saying it's doable, and it is, these are very complicated buildings to, to build. Time. So it's, uh, but it's, it's interesting because we all know that the area all around this and the demographics, everything changes so fast that when you're saying like five years ahead, some of the things you might be designing, you may decide that it's a major reason to change it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that makes it so that you're yeah. trying to get a building permit, but it's tied to, okay. I know Louise has been patiently waiting for that question. Uh, I have, but I think um, you took my question. Right. The overhead, because that really does block the West End as we um, the overhead of the garage piece. Why can't you tear that down in the first phase? I don't see why not. You know, the, the it's an operating garage today and But it's just a piece of well, no, it's it's it's, 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 it's the ramp structure. It's uh, it's it's the ramp structure. It's a it's an it's an integral part of the, the David's guys. It's an integral part of the old garage, but David, David, you can spend time with David. He'll go through. He'll show you. Tom, we'll have a set of diagrams to show phase, phase, phase. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. And there was a woman in the back. Yeah. Yes. I'm frustrated on the schedule thing too because I like to ask them a little differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all understand that anything could happen. If the economy is bad, you're going to slow things down. You might have construction problems you didn't foresee. But you must have a best case scenario. <laughs> so if everything went as smoothly as you wanted it to, when do you think you finish? I'm going to give you the same answer I just gave, <laughs> which is, which is at the next meeting. When is the next meeting? We're, we're going to spend, we're going to spend a fair amount of time, I'm sure, as a group talking about schedule. So. We're going to go through it, and it, it's a little bit like Christmas, and you've come downstairs, and you want to open the present before everybody said open the present. But there's going to be a lot of discussion, I'm sure, about the, about the schedule as we go through it. Jim? Jim Matt, 65, Eastern View Row. I'm a veteran of the Hobby Garage IAG. It's got us to show that. <laughs> um, I, I think I'll say the first thing I said to the, those to that group when they first submitted was, 
is the project site suitable for what you're trying to do? Mm. And I believe this is. I truly believe that you have harvested the best things of this site. And it, while it's difficult, it has a decent footprint. And the second thing you did, which you can keep this sort of kumbaya thing going on that we have here, <laughs> is that you brought the investors with you. Mm -hmm. As the IAG committee, we sat there and we just stamped our feet to try to get to talk to the folks with the investors to make sure that this would not be a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. This is why your question is such a good one. You can put together a dateless schedule because that's a cash <coughs> flow thing. So you can do it. And then you'll back put it on your iCal afterwards. You the problem with this is entry and exit and egress from this place. Same things that we had, they're, they're fundamental problems. But I believe that this is a good project as opposed to the other one, which was just not suitable. Can so, I take one piece, thank you. thank you very much. Can I take one piece of your statement and just plant a little seed for our next meeting about this schedule, okay? One of the things that had been contemplated previously was that the entire garage would be demolished and then the project would happen, okay? I, I for one, am not sure economically how that would work, okay? But when you get to the question of the danger of ending up with a hole in the ground, that's the surest way to end up with a hole in the ground, okay? Yeah. But if you're talking about a phased project, that is economically viable, that can be built, and that we lay out to you exactly, we'll, we'll go through this, I'm sure, but we lay out to you exactly how we're gonna do it, that's the most effective way to get to the end point that we wanna get to as quickly as we can. We're gonna be forthright and direct with you about what it takes and what is hard about this thing, and we're gonna be very clear with you about the schedule as we go through it, I'm sure, but you need to understand that it is, this project, again, will not be all things to all people, okay? This is gonna be a very specific project and the phasing is kind of what makes it work, is really what makes it work at the end of the day. It's a big, huge garage, a million two square feet that we've lived with now for 45 years. It doesn't come down tomorrow, but it's gonna come down, I can tell you. Please, I have one more okay. question. Tom, I wonder if you've talked to the mayor about the school, because first of all, you're talking about three bedroom units. Um, if you're gonna build three bedroom three bedroom units, then where are the children going to go to school? And both, all three communities need a school. <clears throat> I'm a real estate guy. That's, that's kind of what I do. And, uh, uh, that's, but that's the reality. So, so the reality for me is I'm a real estate guy. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, we, we think that the three bedroom units make some sense for families. We think that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, that, I think I've answered that question. I will say, Tom, just on that issue, I think there are ways to advance the cause without contemplating the possibility of building a school on site or, or in any other way bearing the major burden. Yes. And that responsibility, for example, has been assigned to the equity residential project, yes. even though they're not going to build a school on site. I think there are ways to move the ball without necessarily having to cross the finish line yourself. Yeah, it, it, if, if, um, if people ask us to try and be a positive for the discussion and try and help people think through, we're happy to try and help people think it through. Yeah, and I think just to um, follow up with what Bob said, um, don't want to set any um, false expectations at all, but the VRA certainly reserves the right to, during the scoping process, similar to what, excuse me, similar to what equity residential was asked to do to help you know, work with the city to try to analyze um, appropriate sites for the school. So I think there'll be some ongoing dialogue there. Yeah, understand. Thank you. Okay. So I think you just to remind folks, if you have not signed in, please sign into the sign-in sheet. I'll add you to my email distribution list. The next meeting has not been set, but I will certainly uh, keep you posted. Thank you, everybody, for a great meeting.